right, welcome back to This Is J-O-B, the podcast. We're on the Seven Mile Miracle on the North Shore of Oahu. It is Aloha Friday. We drop these videos every Friday, and we have an awesome person I've known for my whole life. He's on set with us today. His name is Kalani Chapman from the North Shore of Oahu. He was a Pipeline Masters finalist the year after I made the final and won. So 2005, he was in the final at the Pipe Masters. Then following it up, 2010, he won the first ever wave of the winter. Kalani Chapman, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, yeah buddy. Thanks for having me. No worries. Um, so if you're not sure who Kalani Chapman is, just check out his IG and you'll figure it out really quick. I mean, what like what what do you feel like people are like really know Kalani Chapman for? I know how I know Kalani Chapman, but tell me, let's talk about this. Um if you don't know me, or <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Let's see. Uh, you know, well, pipeline. Yeah. Basically, um, that's what my my life has revolved around. You know, um, just dedicated my life to surfing that way for the most part. My brother was a one of the craziest surfers out there, and I just wanted to be like him. And yeah. Long story short, just a pipeline surfer. Just like a pipeline surfer, just like myself. Uh, we've probably known each other for, let's let's think about this. I am uh, 39 now. How old are you? 40. Okay. Do you think we knew each other at four years old? Uh, Yeah, around there, four or five, something like that. So before we could remember things, we actually knew each other, and that's kind of how we grew up. Um Kalani and I have been friends ever since. We've traveled the world together. We've surfed massive pipeline for the first time ever together. Like our history, our bond, our friendship is like some of the deepest that like, I don't know, like our friendship's like so grassroots. Born and raised on North Shore, super core family. Family's going through similar situations. And like to be sitting here with you, you're 40, I'm 39, like, Man, we've been through a whole lot, and it's been a crazy ride, to say the least, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, growing up on the North Shore, when we were young, there was, you know, it wasn't, how do I say it? Like, uh, it wasn't the North Shore everybody knows now, you know? It was a lot more um, raw, and, you know, there was more violence, and... Uh, regulation and yeah it was um you know it wasn't it wasn't anything like it is right now you know there weren't big mansions on the beach there was all small you know little plantation plantation homes exactly and um basically everybody knew everybody there wasn't everybody was you know a part if you lived on the north shore you seen You've seen them and you're going to see them every day. And and rent was affordable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very. Yeah. I mean, Kalani, Kalani, like, I mean, from, from like, from what I saw, like you guys grew up with nothing. Like you, like literally your mom was on food stamps. She was a single mom trying to raise Klein Chapman, to, like keep them on the beach, keep you surfing. Your mom had a heart of gold and she was just like, all she wanted to do is like make Kalani Chapman happy. Whether we're just eating ramen and, and cornflakes every day to like, just, just taking a surfing. And my dad would take a surfing. Like we kind of started, like, I would definitely say not, not middle class, maybe a little under there, huh? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was just like you said, we were on food stamps and pretty much a broken family. And our blessings were is that we were raised on the beach. Yeah. So, and- yeah. So, like, food stamps is basically like the government like gives money to people to only buy food and certain things because like you can't afford it really. And, and like coming from a broken family, like Kalani's mom was, um, you know, where did did your parents ever get married? No. Yeah. So they didn't get married. So Kalani like grew up like a single child. Uh, and, and, and actually your mom had two kids to raise and so did my dad. And that's kind of like how they probably like met and crossed paths. But I'm like so lucky to like be a friend of Kalani from like four years old. So sick, huh? Yeah. I got, uh, I got a funny story. So when we were, when we were younger hanging out, um, 
you know, straight into like Hanabata days, which means like <laughs> just like little, little baby days. Snot draining from your nose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, Kalani and I were in like, I think it was like second grade or something. We were, we're in the same high school together and uh, <laughs> Kalani and I were same class, same everything. Um, me and Kalani decided to steal some stuff from this teacher's desk oh. and this yep. was a bad idea, but we thought it was a good idea at the time. And we lollipops. Didn't... Yeah, lollipops. Yeah. We ended up scoring a bunch of lollipops out of the teacher's uh, desk when she left. And next thing you know, me we're, and... we were talking to the cops on the phone. Yeah. I don't even know how they can call the cops at such a young age, but they were calling the cops. And and, and then she's like, do you want to go to jail? And we're like, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> I don't want to. And then I remember Kalani and I just like crying our eyes off. And then um, they, they sent us home. <laughs> yeah i was like oh no dude do you remember the, uh, it was the first time i ever seen like a phone with a screen we were actually talking to the police officers on a little screen I remember it was that. a cordless phone or not i'm sorry it, it had a cord and everything but somehow <laughs> there's a screen it was like i don't know I've n back then you you didn't see a phone with a screen on it yet. yeah and yeah we were like talking to the police officer on the phone looking at him on this little screen and it was so scary we we're just we we're we thought we were gonna get arrested or something but yeah <laughs> you're a pretty radical kid like when we were growing up I, I was like i didn't even know what cutting school was and we were like cutting school and like we we're just like in in between two buildings but we we're still at school but we weren't going to class and like you're like telling me like, oh, like we don't need to wear underwear. Underwear is not cool. So we'd like go into the toilets <laughs> and flush our toilet or flush our underwear down the toilets. And like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just like all these weird things I remember of you and I growing up. Yeah. Probably got a lot of that from my brother. You know, yeah. he was um, he was the cool guy and he was letting me know what was cool and what wasn't. <clears throat> no, definitely. So or what's not cool. I mean, cutting school isn't cool, but like. <laughs> You know, I was just listening to him. Yeah, no. So so when I would go over to hang out with Kalani at his house, he lived on the beach at sunset. And it's like in a very like tattered, beat down house. The house does not exist to this day. Um, it's 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 a mansion now. Like like how Kalani was saying, like there were there used to be all these mansions on the beach. No, no, there, there used to be no mansions on the beach. Now there's all the mansions to where where, where we grew up. But um, yeah, it's just just like Kalani's brother his name is Sean Briley. He was the most radical surfer ever to hit the scene. He was the first like OG pipeline free surfer, blonde haired, blue eyes. Didn't give a about anybody. He, Sean was actually, in a sense, the first Grom to ever surf pipe. Yeah, no, no, for sure. He was getting two page spreads when he was like 16 in Kahuku high school still and like yeah there wasn't kids surfing pipe yet yeah and and quick he was like he was sponsored by quicksilver he was getting paychecks he was buying like lifted uh jeep cherokee it's like like sean was like if he wasn't surfing radical gnarly waves or going left at YMA or like just doing suicides off the top of 12 footers at pipe or or getting wave of the winter before it was even wave of the winter like Sean Briley was up in the mountains on his um, off time when, when it was dark, four, four wheeling his beautiful trucks that he's purchased from the dealership from these Quicksilver endorsement deals and rolling his truck. And you'd hear these like crazy stories like, oh, Sean Briley almost died. He rolled his truck down the mountain. He did this. He did that. And it was just like the way he lived his life was so radical. And you as like his younger brother, how, how many years do you guys separate? Eight. Eight, eight years. <sighs> Yeah, eight years. I remember going over there and just like partying, chicks in the room. I was just like, whoa, like this guy is gnarly. Like, yeah. Sean was an extremist in everything he did. Yeah. He would not hold back. You know, if he was on a dirt bike, he would go full throttle, do the biggest air he could. He, if he was surfing, he would go on the biggest wave nobody wanted. <clears throat> if he was in a car going fast, he would do it with no lights, you know, the in the dark or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. He he didn't have much regard for life when he was young, and he just, you could see it in everything he did. Yeah, exactly. So growing up, like at a young age, I mean, coming into the pipeline scene, I remember you, we, we like kind of, I wouldn't say like stopped hanging out, but like you kind of like, we changed like different friend, friend groups, and yeah. like you were kind of doing your thing, I was doing my thing. 
I kind of, I kind of like, I wouldn't say I stopped hanging out with you, but you guys are just doing like such different things than I was doing. And, yeah. and I remember like you, you would just pal out the pipe with just like your brother's attitude, same chain, just, I'm going to go, go, go for it. And you'd pal out the pipe and you just, you just, you brought this, like, you brought this feeling into the lineup. Like I'm going to come out here. I'm going to take any wave I want. And if you got a problem, you're going to have to deal with my brother. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like it was, it was raw and rad. Yeah. You know, I just, like I said, he was, um, who I looked up to and I wanted to be like him. And that was his attitude towards, you know, basically surfing pipeline. And I wanted to do the same. Yeah. If, if I wanted to get the biggest barrels I could find and I wasn't going to let anybody get in my way for the most part, you know, and just, how do I say it? Just don't think twice and just go yeah just like your brother i mean and then like like speaking of like don't think twice just go like i remember you had a surfing magazine cover and like at that time that was like that was as big as it gets in surfing you land a cover a surfing magazine you are on fire and i remember you're on quicksilver you're standing in this specific barrel you're on the cover and i was like wow kalani's like a real force to be reckoned with like to live like under your brother's name and, and to make your own name, that was, that was like radical. Yeah. Um, that cover, the surfing magazine cover was my, that was my into professional surfing. I wasn't getting paid before that. Um, you know, I got the cover people, they actually kind of like, you know, seen what I was really about. And I, uh, yeah, it was my start to professional surfing. It was definitely your start. I was 18 years old, wasn't going to school anymore. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, it was pretty crazy because with that cover, I literally like kind of manifested it. Like I was like, before it even happened, I was like, you know, this winter I'm going to get a cover. And I really had my mindset on what I wanted to do. And I uh, I pulled it off and yeah. It helped my whole career with surfing. Started it off. So, like, getting the cover of Surfing Magazine, kind of, like, what was the next steps? Like, obviously, the the surf world took recognition of Kalani Chapman, and they started to understand, like, all right, this this kid got the cover. Like, there's a reason when you get a cover. Like, they know you've been earning this, and you've been working hard. And, like, it, was only, it wasn't even a matter if. It was a matter of when Kalani Chapman was on the cover. Like, how did this change your whole surfing career whole surfing dynamic from like making no money from surfing to landing a cover and getting the respect that you finally deserved yeah it was you know it, it's great because it allowed me to have a little money to travel and to broaden my horizons and you know show people basically that i'm not going anywhere and just uh how do i say you know just just do my thing and not really care what people are thinking and you know just uh yeah anyway well like so after the cover we're like sponsors like yo like we want to start paying you or you're like yo i'm like on covers of magazines like I, I would like be happy if you guys could help buy food or help me pay my rent like how did it go down yeah so when i got the cover that was kind of like the golden age of surfing like once you actually put yourself on the map People knew what you're about and, you know, therefore I was getting what, 500 bucks a month maybe or something from quick and it was enough to pay for rent and, you know, a couple other sponsors flowed me a little bit of money to pay for food. It still wasn't like, you know, I wasn't getting rich or anything by any means, but I was, I was making it and that's all that mattered. When you're young, you know, you just need enough to, to keep going. You know, it's not like you're not. I wasn't in the position to ask for big money yet or anything. It was just more so to just to pay for rent and keep it going. Yeah. Like get your foot in the door. Like I got the cover. Like I felt like at that time of your life, like you were like, you know, you're out at Waimea charging the biggest waves too. And like, it wasn't only like this pipe thing, like you were ripping at sunset. You knew the lineup, like no one else knew it because you grew up in front of sunset beach and like, you kind of had all these waves dialed at such a young age, but like what made you like really like focus in on pipeline and like knew like that's the direction that Kalani Chapman's going to go. Well, for myself, like 
it was I was a young age and all my brother's friends would be coming over to the house and be like, you're going to charge like your brother, you know, you're going to, you're going to surf pipe like Sean. And I'm just like, uh, I guess. Yeah, sure. And by the time it, it, you know, it, uh, was my turn. I finally understood what they were talking about. And I was like, yes, you know, I got a job washing dishes at D'Amico's and I was getting paid like five bucks an hour. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't, Five you know, bucks an hour, the old minimum <laughs> there, wage. Yeah, there's a there's a whole another world I could be chasing, and this isn't it. And so I was, yeah, I took that motivation and and started trying to be a pro surfer. Yeah. So Kalani was like, he, he got a job washing dishes at Diamico's. Diamico's is like Pizza Hut before Pizza Hut on the North Shore. Like <laughs> they made the best pizzas in town, and it was straight across the street from Kalani's house, and we'd eat plenty of pizzas there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yep. A lot of uh, breakfast tacos and all kinds of stuff. It was pretty much like if you lived on the North Shore, that was kind of like one of your first jobs or, you know, like uh, that's where a lot of the North Shore originals would work. Yeah, definitely. You'd you'd walk into D'Amico's and there'd be legends everywhere. There'd be like Davy Miller, like making pizzas behind the counter, and you're like, oh, Davy Miller, or like Davy Contrell. Like there's like all these like like top dog surf guys working to just make it to stay and pay rent on the North Shore. It wasn't like the thing, right? It wasn't like people were making millions and millions and millions of dollars surfing on the North Shore. Like they were just they were there for the love and the core of the sport, and they just. They, they're just adrenaline junkies looking for the adrenaline. And that's kind of how we were raised, like through our parents. And like, I don't know, that's, there's a reason why we end up on the North Shore, right? Yeah. The North Shore is just, how do I say it was, um, the community is so tight or it, the, the community was so small and tight back then. It was really like, it was special if you even fit in, you yeah. know, because not everybody liked you or, you know, like you could easily get into trouble and, uh, you know, pretty much get chased out of there if you weren't fitting in correctly. I feel like you were always getting in trouble because like your older brother was like this, like, like he like held such a high statue of like, like how far you could push the limits. And like, I remember like just being younger, you're always pushing the boundaries because you, you, you had such big shoes to fill, like growing up on the North shore and, and I, I just like, I don't know, like, I just always felt like that's how you lived your life. You're like, you're, you're still filling these shoes until like, until nowadays, you know, it's like, now it's like your home, you're on the North shore. You're like a, you know, what a third generation, um, family here. Yeah. yeah. So, so Kalani Chapman's family's been, um, you know, here before or just when surfing really started popping off huh yeah, 1963 1963 hawaii became a state in 59 there you go so <laughs> is is it your mom's brother is al chapman yep and gary uh chappy chapman he's the my uncle chappy was the first one that came here in 63 he made it before al or anybody so he kind of paved the road for us here in hawaii and uh Chappie was a huge part of, of surfing, period. Dick Brewer and, and Chappie started the shortboard revolution in right. Huntington Beach. Yep. You know, back in the 60s, I, um, it was just a, all longboards being ridden still. And, you know, those guys were basically taking a lot of LSD and tripping out and uh, – changing surfboards every day making them smaller different fins you know experimenting with with uh shapes and just all surfboards period and uh yeah chappy came down to the beach i've heard it from several people that were there and they're like yeah we seen your uncle basically paddle out the first minigun which was a shortboard back then yep so yeah my family you know has a, a big history in surfing and in Hawaii and in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really cool. Cause like, if you don't know who Al Chapman is, Al Chapman really um, was a pioneer of big wave surfing from sunset to pipeline to Waimea. I mean, he is still a guy still to this day. How old's Al? 
72, I believe. So Al Chapman's 72. He's still surfing Big Sunset. You'll still see him out at Waimea. Like he is a lover of surfing and he's a great guy. Every time I see him, he's so happy to see me. I'm just happy he remembers me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just just literally, if you Google or, or just look up Al Chapman, you're going to probably see him on like a 25-footer. This guy is legit, gnarly, and a legend. Shaped his own boards and did his own thing his way. Yeah, yep. He was a soul surfer, and, you know, there wasn't a lot of money back then for them to, you know, to make. And... There wasn't there wasn't even leashes yet, you yeah. know. They're they're swimming for their boards, you know. He surfed with Eddie Ikal. He was Eddie's friend, actually. Yeah, you know he so cool. he was in the Duke Kahanamoku contest. It's legendary. But, yeah, just you know, the, people, you know, th these weren't hand out. They weren't handed out. You know, this is stuff that you had to like. You had to be that good to be invited, you know, or whatnot. Like, yeah. yeah. No, so so like I remember probably how long have you been shaping surfboards five years or so so yeah i was gonna say i remember about five years ago you're looking at me and i'm looking at you and you're like i was said he would teach me how to shape and i i, I gotta i gotta take this opportunity because he's getting older and I, I he's not gonna ever ask me again i was like i was like you should do it and you're like yeah i'm gonna do it and i remember you like kind of started like going in there and then i would like look at you and just be like shape the board and you're like huh like are you gonna teach me anything you're gonna help me and he's just like I want to see what you could do. And like, he was like super, like, um, super, um, I don't know. Like he does, he's, he's not going to like, just give you all these handouts and tell you how to teach a board, how he teaches the board. Cause he does not use machines. He's all hand shape. He has all his own molds of how he built his boards. And, and I just really liked that about him. He was like, it's like, I don't, I don't know how many boards you had to shape before he even gave you a hint of what to do right or what to do wrong. And you'd spend, hours and hours on end in the shaping bay in Wailua where they shape these boards. And I was just like, man, how does Kwani handle this? Like mm -hmm. uncle, I was not telling him. He's like, tells him a little bit, just enough to keep him motivated, but like still probably five years later, not telling you everything he knows. Yeah, no, he, um, he always brings up like, you know, I paid my dues. You're going to pay your dues. You know, I'm not yeah. going to hold your hand. You know, he's, he definitely shows me things and he's a teacher, but, He's not just going to lay everything out on a platter and, and uh, hold my hand, basically. It's not going to make it easy for you. No, no. But he, I owe so much to him already with what he's taught me because I would still be so behind. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, it's, it's a humbling thing. Like, as a surfer, as a pro surfer, you think, oh, I can, you know, I could shape a board, no yep, problem. Yep. Oh, yeah, well, here's the measuring tape and here's this and here's that. Let's see it. Yeah. And there's so much that goes into making boards, you know, not just shaping, but glassing, sanding. It's um it's it's a very special thing and it's not easy. Not easy. Yeah. All these board makers are are very special people. We owe them yep. a lot. Yeah, we do. Um yeah, just just to jump in, right? So <laughs> I only shaped one surfboard my whole life. And it was it's kind of funny story. So um surfing magazine, that was the magazine that Kalani got the cover of uh hit me up and was like hey we want to do this article and it's like how um jamie o'brien shapes a surfboard and rides his own surfboard or whatever it was i'm like oh yeah sick let's do it <laughs> yo what's up turn it off <laughs> <laughs> sorry um so so basically they were like how d press the button on the side all right so so i had this thing uh surfing magazine hit me up they're like would you want to do a surfboard shaping and then you would ride your own surfboard thing with surfing magazine? We're going to do like a four, five page um, article. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no worries. I'll do that. So I hit up Wade to Coral. I'm like, yo, Wade, um, I would like to uh, shape a board at your, your um, at shaping bay and I'm going to ride it and we're going to document this whole thing. And if you can, can you give me some pointers along the way? And this is kind of like, this is kind of like before they had like uh what is it? The shaping things that just shape, shape the board for you. And, um, it was fu a funny story for me. Cause I was like, I remember I was like, you know, this is a long time ago. I was like trying to go hang out with like a bunch of people and I'm like trying to shape this board really fast. And like my mind wasn't in the shaping bay and all I'm trying to do is just get this thing done. 
and it was really hard. I remember going through with a planer and like kind of like messing the rail up and I had to make the board a lot thinner than I actually wanted to. And there was all this like stuff going on and I was like, oh, just trying to get this thing done, done, done. And like yeah. I, ru- I rushed it. Yeah. And that's the exact opposite of what you want to do. Yeah. So, so it, then, so this, so, sorry to cut you off. So, yeah. so then I had to um, uh, help class it. And then oh. I got the board down to the beach and the rails. One rail was about three inches thick and the other one was about two inches thick. And it was like this the, the weirdest thing I ever seen in my life. I was like, oh my God, like that was pretty hard. Maybe I shouldn't have rushed, rushed it. And I took the board out at back door. We're like filming, we're taking pictures. And it was probably the worst board I've ever rode in my whole life. I remember pumping down the line going to set up to do a turn and the board would just keep going straight and then I would fall backwards and I couldn't figure out how to ride this board. And, and I was like, Oh man, this is like, I wish I would have like spent a little bit more time in the shaping bay, you know, instead of rushing it. And that's the thing with shaping is you need to take your time. And, uh, my buddy, I owed him some, um, like this is probably a couple of months down the line. I owed him some, um, some money for helping me with doing like a film project. And I was like, I was like, how about just like a Takoro or something? And I kind of looked through my quiver and I was like, well, that's the board I shaped right there. And then I was like, I was like, here you go. Like, I'll give you this Takoro. But it was like, it was, <laughs> it was not a Takoro. Like, it was the O'Brien. No, <laughs> it was it was the first board I ever shaped, and it was the worst board ever, and probably the last board I ever shaped because it's really hard. And I gave it to my buddy. And about a month later, he goes, dude, that's the best board I ever rode in my life. And I was like, get out of here. And I was like, oh, no way. I love that to Coral, huh? And he's like, yeah, dude, that board's so sick. <laughs> then he hit me three months later and was like, yo, I, I th- the board got stolen. Do you think you could get me another one? And I was just like, I was just laughing. I was telling my friends like, oh my God, this guy thinks he's riding to Coral. Like maybe I did a good job. Or, or then to come to think about, it, I don't think he was that good of a surfer. and never, never really knew how to surf. And maybe that was just like first smaller board. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, Funny story. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's a good story. You know, uh, my uncle he mentioned to me. He's like, you know, your your surfing's gonna suffer when you first when you're first learning how to shape your boards. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, okay, cool, or not cool, but <laughs> okay. And I um I had a a board. I I rode this winter. It was six six nine, and I literally took it out on a good day a good morning at pipeline and i i took three gnarly wipeouts on the board and i basically i was thinking about what owl said and how my my surfing was gonna suffer and i kind of laughed in my mind and i was like oh what about my body is my body gonna suffer from it too but yeah it's just like you know um You, you take wipeouts, yeah. you know, you, sh- you shape your own boards and you realize they're not like exactly perfect and you learn the hard way. Yeah, definitely learn, learn the hard way. And, and you know, to, to, to bring that back up, I was actually watching you that surf session. I was like, I was on the fence about maybe going out or not going out. I'm like, and and at, 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 when you live a pipe or just around pipeline, you kind of like sit there and you go, should I go out? Should I not? Should I go out? Should I not? And I looked out there. I saw my boy Kalani take off on a wave, eat it so bad. I was like, oh my God. Like look up another 10 minutes later, see you wipe out again. I was like, oh, bro. <laughs> I was like, dude, this is not good. Like, I don't want to go surf. Then I see you do it for the third time. Then uh, fast forward two hours. I remember paddling out and you paddle back out and you're on a different board. I was yeah. like, dude, you took some heavy wipeouts earlier. You're like, yeah. I shaped that board. I made some mistakes on the board and like I, I really learned from from um that experience. And going back to Uncle Al telling you you're gonna suffer when you surf, especially surfing waves of consequences, yeah. like pipeline, like that's that's radical. Yeah. It and it was what was cool about that that day is that I had that first session, I took some wipeouts. And the swell is coming up like, oh, I'm going to go grab my brand new 9.6 that I shaped. I, I've been riding a 9.6 all winter at Pipeline. Um, yeah. Anyway, I grabbed the board, never ridden it before, and ended up just having a great session afterwards. Yep. Every single wave made it. Um, yeah. So, you know, first session didn't work out so well. Second <laughs> session did shape both boards i shaped and you know it's just uh yeah 
testing and you know seeing what's working and what's not how so how is it surfing on one of the boards that you shaped like how much do you feel like you learn right when you paddle out whether it's at pipeline or at rocky point or YMA? like when you paddle out on your own board are you like critiquing yourself the whole time you're riding the board you're like in the barrel on the drop coming off the bottom like how's this board like fitting into this wave yeah well first of all it's like if it's the first wave you've ever caught on the board you just don't even know you don't know yeah you're just like well god you know watch over me i hope uh this works out pr- correctly and uh you just got to give it a go pick the best wave you can find and drop in and hopefully you're getting spit out and not you know do you, do you feel like going over the falls <laughs> do you feel like that you you finally got into a point where you could kind of shape a board and you're like okay this board looks good and then you could put it under your hand and be like this is the board because i feel like you know working with shapers our whole life like we could look at a board and be like eh, it kind of looks weird and you could put it on your arm and be like oh yeah this is the board like you like know instantly that this is the board and i'm not sure if you have that feeling or had that feeling yet but have you yeah you know um the nine six i was telling you about that i surfed yep that board is it's treating me well i bet yeah i've caught in probably like eight or ten ten foot waves this winter made them all i was there for one of them yeah and um you know that's a good ratio yeah you know it's yep. um you want to have you want to have confidence in what you're riding, obviously, because your life depends on it. Yep. And um, yeah, whenever I stand up on the board, it feels totally natural and like I've ridden it before. And yep. all I got to do is just stand up and go. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, the w- at that point, it's your uh, wave selection. Yeah. You know, yeah. the board's going to do its job. It's just like if you pick the right wave. Yeah, that's true. I mean, like when, when you're like looking at a wave, like how many different things are you looking at? Are you like looking at me starting to paddle and you're like, Jamie's engaging, but I already kind of saw it and I'm on a bigger board. I'm going to chase this thing out the back. And like, I'm going to like, cause like in my mind, right. There's so many things that go through in my mind. Right. I already know if you caught a wave in the lineup or, or Co or John or Nate or Tamayo, like I already kind of know what's happened in the last like 30 minutes. Yeah. And I'm like looking at it, I'm like, Holy cow, Jamie's fine. I'm like, and, and some, and sometimes I ask Kalani, I'm like, are you, you going to go? And you're like, you kind of like look at me and then I look at you and you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, for me, I try to find the waves that are like showing themselves to me. You know, basically they're like, here I am, yeah. you know, are you going to, you're going to go? Yeah. You know, like they're almost talking to me. They're yeah. almost calling my name. And um, those are usually the ones that I commit to. Yeah. You know, like there's so many waves to chase out there. Speaking of waves of chase, I wanted to talk to you about something. So when you won Wave of the Winter in 2010, this is a very special day and a very special moment. Unfortunately, um, for me, I couldn't surf that day. But that same day was Andy Iron's funeral on the North Shore of Kauai at Hanalei Bay. And we like thousands and thousands of people from different islands flew over to Kauai to be there for this event. Very special uh, send off for a very special person. And I remember the surf was coming up. It was like our first North shore swell. It was like mid November. And uh, we all went to the palau, did the blessing, beautiful send off for Andy. And uh, you decided to jump on a plane and head back home because you knew the swell was coming up, right? Yeah. Yeah. We seen the swell coming days in advance and it was like, you know, and Andy's funeral was the day before was supposed to be the day before the swell hit. And yeah, we went, went to Kauai and, you know, we, we, uh, sent Andy off in a, in a beautiful way and he was on my mind a lot and I wanted to do something special for him. And the next day I was, I, I, I flew home. Next day, pipeline was firing 8, 10, 12 feet. And uh, I basically, I, I, I caught some waves and I was like, oh, I want to do, you know, like a prayer for Andy or something. And like, so I, uh, yeah, I found a beautiful wave and dropped in and I just put my hands together and just put my head down in the barrel and just, you know, like basically said a prayer, you know, like, and uh, 
got spit out and it was a sick wave um you basically premeditated this wave for andy and andy goes here you go Kalani boy this way is for you and, yep. and you just he was Kalani was like in the barrel doing a praying sign and he was so deep and it was such a gnarly like like inside ledger wave and it just spit so hard and he came out after the spit and like the whole the whole the whole beach probably went wild and and like i felt like andy just sent that wave for you yeah i mean it's a spiritual thing surfing pipeline and you know um i don't see why it couldn't have happened you yeah know, so and i mean an incredible moment right in your career you yeah. know like, yeah i like i um yeah you know i wanted to do something special and and it all came together and yeah somehow the wave of the winter only lasted six weeks that year it was yeah. the very first one they had and dean morrison got a wave at back door there was some swells and some some rides but that was that was the swell in the six weeks and yep. i got the wave that they liked yeah i mean it was a very credible wave you know you, you're probably on a pretty big board you got an early set your line you got super deep yeah and you came out after the spit because there, there's there's some some things that like be spoken upon when you're surfing pipeline it is steep and deep and you know just as critical as the wave could be and i feel like you kind of checked all the boxes off right there and the people that were judging the wave of the winter like likes of jerry lopez and and ross williams and a, and a and sean briley and a, and a heavy fleet of people involved in picking that wave i think it was a well-deserved wave and and a very legendary way to do it and in, in honor of andy irons yeah yeah um my brother wasn't a judge yet but poncho ross <laughs> and jerry lopez yeah they they uh they're the ones that picked the wave and yeah I found out uh, Christmas Eve. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. They called me and told me Christmas Eve, and yeah, it was probably some of the best news I ever heard. Yeah, love it. Um, all right, so I want to kind of jump into something a little bit deeper. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about your 2005 Pipeline Masters finals, um, but we're going to jump a couple years ahead uh, into... Uh, the Dehui backdoor shootout. I'm not sure what year it was. No, it, was a, it was 2011. That happened right after uh, the wave of the winter. It was yeah, because you know it was 2010, 2011 winter. Yeah, winter. Yep. So it was like one month, one month, and I oh. won the wave of the winter, and then the shootout. Yeah, I got you, second. Yeah, but you got like the craziest wave ever. Like like your wave was like a 12 or something. Yeah. Like. The, it, the waves Kalani waits for a pipe. I don't really want. He wants them. I'll give them to him. He wants that thing. He could have it. Like <laughs> he rode an incredible wave and got an incredible score. And you went on to, you know, probably not even being like in contention to like straight to like first or second place off of one wave. Yeah. That's yeah. how you surf. It's radical and you, they're going to get radical scores and you're going to get rewarded very well. Yeah. That, that winter a lot came together for me you know i got wave of the winter and to be honest the the wave of the winter didn't totally like it didn't feel like it was like you know the wave of the winter because yeah. it was like six weeks and i got a i got a sick wave and everything but when i got that wave in the shootout the 12 that that to me more solidified everything like mm -hmm. okay that was a, a wave of the winter yeah you know like well I feel like you're on your way, right? Like there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's like a path, right. To like get your foot in the door and surfing, you know, first it's, you know, putting the time in and, and, and getting good waves. Then it's to get the cover of the magazine. Then it's to maybe get into the pipeline masters. And then you made the final. And then, then a couple of years later, you win wave of the winner. Then following up, boom, like, you know, out of all the magic you've done in between then, then you're like second place to who you backed our shootout. Perfect. 12, like, you're on a roll. Yeah, no, that was a kind of a stellar uh, winner for me. Yeah, like force to be reckoned with. You're you're putting your, you know, you're just putting your head down and doing what Klein Chapman does best is surf you and know, have fun. You know, what's kind of cool about that that season was I got those two waves, the wave of the winter, and then the shootout wave, and I believe it was March thirty first. It was the last last day pipeline broke that year, and I got like the best wave i've ever got out there yeah like oh yeah, like yeah yeah the one super deep like 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this wasn't like some roll in. This was oh, like no. first reef as deep from point A to point B and it spits so hard. That's probably one of the best waves I've ever seen ridden at pipeline. And you're on a nine six seven four. Seven four. Yeah. Brewer Chapman? No, that was a rusty. Rusty. Yeah. Back in I'm the I'm thinking rusty about days. another wave. <laughs> You've got a lot of these waves. It's possible. That's time and dedication. No. You know the board you gave me? Yes. The, no, that's that's the nine six but what about that wave head. that wave shouldn't even that wave should have broke like five miles out the sea and it decided <laughs> to load up on first reef and and just be this this iconic you got so many crazy ways yeah that like, that's uh that board is the it was in 2005 right around the yep. pipeline masters yep. time yeah malik passed away and oh that was heavy yeah that was a really that was a radical uh radical year so yeah. in, in 2005, a radical year, especially, you know, in, in December, you made the first uh, Pipeline Masters final of your life. And uh, how old were you there? 23. 23 years old. You made the Pipeline Masters finals like literally one year after I did. And I was just like, wow, this is so cool. Like North Shore boys holding it down. Like, you know, you're a force to be reckoned with. Who were who you in the finals with? I was in the finals with Bruce McFanning and Andy Irons. There you go. Yeah. Gnarly. I made it from the trials, surf seven heats or something like that. Got three of the, three of the four best scores of the contest. Yep, and, you're on a roll. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, what, what happened in the final? So you, you got fourth in the final, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it was just like, like the waves kind of, kind of got small and it wasn't like, like how you like to surf pipeline? Yeah, everything changed. You know, it, it kind of got on shore a little bit and it turned into more backdoor than pipeline. It was pipe the whole entire event, but kind of dropped a little bit to more like four to six foot backdoor. And yep. The wind was a little, you know, funky and it was a regular foot's pretty much heat at that point. I think you, you caught a wave that was a really sick backdoor wave and you ended up sitting on your butt in the barrel and you're like, you're like, oh man, like it was like kind of a mistake, but like could have been a big score, but you kind of slit. It was kind of, it was pretty classic. Yeah. That was like semifinals or something. Semifinals. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but no, that was like what we're talking about. That's like, these are like the best times of my life. You know, yeah. those are like childhood goals, you know, stuff we talked about when we were 10 years old, you know, so well, we want to be in the pipe masters and make win the contest and you know i uh i got to look at andy i was right next to andy when he was putting that pipeline masters trophy above his head and i was just looking at just like whoa you know like yeah. so close you know so but close but um i'm good with all of it you know like, yeah to me i won you know yeah. I, <laughs> you won to me yeah it was, it, it's um I think we, that's close enough. I think we know? celebrated that night like you won too. Oh, like yeah. there was no other winners in, yeah. in our hearts. Like we we had the craziest party at my dad's house right there at the fifty yard line at Pipeline, and um, yeah, I think Kalani woke up in the bushes the next day, and, <laughs> and I was in the bushes, and everyone just had this crazy night, and and we celebrated it and sent sent it off. As, you, you know, um, the best part of that whole entire contest was when I was. The heat ended and I was like, okay, like I, you know, I got fourth. I basically yeah. knew and I was like, okay, I'm out of here and I'm riding a wave in and I see all the boys just running through the crowd coming like to meet me at the water's edge. And I'm like, what's going on? And like, they just threw me on their shoulders. I think Jamie was popping champagne already, like spraying me, Makua, <laughs> um, all the boys, they carried me up the beach. Like that was the the love for my friends was that was pretty much more special than any you know that was the most special part of the whole contest to me you know like they they treated me like i was the champion and yeah it was it was i'll never forget it you're the hometown champ pipeline masters i mean <laughs> just just really a, a childhood dream for all of us for me for you um like first first pipeline masters finals i made i was in 2001 i got fourth i was starstruck i was sitting there in the lineup looking around like oh my god like bruce is in my heat and and so and so and, and sunny and like i just i didn't and kelly and i i just i just kind of blacked out and just i wasn't me 
And I was like, if I ever get the opportunity <laughs> ever again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this whole thing different. And then in 2004, I win the Pipeline Masters. On you know, it was, it was just my time, my moment, and that's all it is. Is is your time and your moment. You're not like a pipeline master. Like it's, that was yeah. your time. That was your moment. And, and and back in back in those years, you know, there was a whole trials you had to go to, like yep. sixteen of of pipeline specialists, and that was like its own contest there. Yep. And if you know you you make it through that, then you start to go against the CT guys. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's no joke. It, yeah, it no, was, no, I'll I'll explain it. So so basically, to be in the pipeline masters back in the day, you would have to qualify to be in the pipeline masters trials. That was a task on its own. Once you qualified for the Pipeline Masters Trials, it was an event they held the day before the Pipeline Masters, and you there would be 16 guys competing against each other, like 16 of like Hawaii's best and a couple of wild cards thrown in to compete against each other. And then once you qualified for that, then you would be in the Pipeline Masters. So if you're saying you went on to make eight heats in a pipeline master this guy probably served 16 heats to even get there to even have this opportunity to be in the final like there's a lot of work behind the scenes that went down and this is not only just for you for me for for everybody johnny boy and all the all the boys like this this is like a i don't know this is a hard task yeah yeah not there's only been what three or four guys that have ever done it i think yeah exactly so so going from the highs to the lows you know like i've been there through your highs you've been there through my highs like you know i broke both legs surfing pipeline those were my lows i've got knocked out multiple times but very for a very short period of time um we were competing in the backdoor shootout and it was towards the end of the day, the waves are 10 to 12 foot. It was second reefing. And it was kind of like everything that we love pipeline for, you know, it was like, it was big, it was gnarly. And these are the days that Kalani gets his waves. And, and, um, he took off on the back, uh, out the back, second reef rolling in. I remember paddling over. I was like, yeah, Kalani boy. And you kind of set it up nice off the inside and heard the beach roar. It was like this big double up thing. You went down and, um, yeah, I, I just, I, it was uh, one of the craziest moments of my life because I saw the jet skis looking for you. And it was just like, like there, I was like, oh my God, Kalani's hurt. Like, how bad is this? And I, and as, as like a friend, I started paddling like from Second Reef into, you know, to, to find you, to look for you. Cause I didn't really know what was going on. I saw the water patrol pulling on your board and they started pulling on your leash and they kind of let it go, thinking maybe you came off your leash. And I, Obviously, you weren't. You were. You were like knocked out, unconscious. Did you hit your head on the reef? Did you hit your board? What happened? From from what we understand. Well, like you were saying, I caught the wave, came into first reef, set my line. That's a, that's the last thing I remember. Yeah. Set my line, but in the video, uh, the wave kind of threw this like chandelier, maybe from the wind a little mm -hmm. bit, and. Uh, you know, I fell off my board, wiped out. I ended up hitting my head um, in two different places, and I knocked out underwater and basically drowned in front of everybody. I drowned, and I was I was underwater for a long time. Luckily, the this was the last heat of the day. Luckily, yep. the jet ski was still out there. Yep. Seth Moniz, Nathan Florence, everybody that was in any of the heats there was two heats i think that yeah were being ran or something but anyway everybody like dropped everything and came and they were there to help save my life and they got me on the ski got me in you know re revived me on the beach in front of everybody yeah i was blue and purple and I, I these are just stories that i've heard yeah so 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 from my understanding that the the jet ski operators they, they started pulling your leash but your leash was like a 12 15 foot leash and they were like oh he's not on the, on the board and like and like you know like i don't know you have all these like theories and ideas of like oh i could uh if i if i get hurt a pipeline it's going to be on the drop or if i get hurt on pipeline it's going to be at back door or like whatever you have all these ideas but where you hit the reef was towards the end of the wave and it wasn't even like a huge gnarly wave like you probably rode a million more gnarly waves than that one it was like that was the one that that got you and it, it changed my mind and put a new perspective in. It doesn't matter where you fall at pipeline. 
it's just as dangerous as the takeoff or yeah. or anywhere and i remember they they got you on that jet ski I, I wasn't to you at the point or i was trying my hardest to like paddle over there and i'm like i'm like i didn't even know like i'm like so many emotions going through my head like my friend my friend i gotta help him i gotta help him and the next thing you know they had that you on the jet ski and i was stuck in the the current getting sucked back out the sea and i'm like doing my own thing trying to get to you and i get to the beach and Kalani's black and blue and i'm like oh my god like this is the worst thing ever and they're they're trying to revive you on the beach they it takes quite a bit you know you're probably like out for like six seven minutes they get you kind of like foaming you're kind of like moving i'm like tripping i'm like oh my god and the ambulance are showing up and they're putting you in the ambulance and i'm trying to call your brother and your mom and i'm just like i'm like i'm like breaking down i'm like crying and like it was like to me like as like one of your best friends i was i was just like oh like you know like this wave that give us everything that that like makes us so happy made me so sad that day and i was like i was like i didn't know like if i was ever gonna surf pipe and i didn't know if i was ever gonna see you again and because like they were like yeah well we kind of got like him you know breathing a little bit but like we don't know and your brother showed up and he like he's like he the way he hand i think he jumped in the the ambulance with you and i was just like tripping out and i remember calling your brother later that night and he doesn't answer too many people's phone calls so i was like glad he answered mine and, and he was like you know we're not we're not through we're not through the the night jamie like anything could happen i was like well baby's gonna be all right he's like he's like we're still in the dark jamie there's a lot of lung water water in his lungs and um there's a chance he could not make it and i was just like oh like and from yeah. the serious person most serious person i ever met in my life like a person i looked up to my whole life that like just lived such a radical life was telling me such a radical thing i was just like i was like oh my god like this is so gnarly i couldn't sleep the whole night i was tripping like you know i could only imagine what your body was going through what your mom what oh and what sean like everything and i was just like i, I like didn't want to surf pipe i was like i'm done i can't surf pipeline like just just my my friend like i don't know like to me it was super super gnarly you went through it all but I'm, I'm glad to like be sitting here with you now like telling not not glad to tell this story but i'm glad you lived through it and the craziest part is is you're just as crazy still to this day <laughs> dude you, you can you want those psycho ones still yeah man you know i um pipeline and mother nature has pretty much gave me everything you know it's given me some of the best times of my life and some of the the worst and i um i just got a passion for it and a love and i'm not ready to stop you know it's there's nothing like getting spit out of a barrel there's just not nothing you know? like it yeah and i'll do it till the till the you know till till, till like, i can't do it anymore yeah that's you know, that's basically. how i feel and I, I feel like you helped me give me motivation like that and and Derek ho and michael ho like I, there's a reason why I just keep going and going and going. And you're one of those people. Every time the waves are big, Kalani Chapman calls me up and he goes, Jamie, we're going to hit it. We're going to go surf. Or like the waves are big. When you want to paddle out, like you're just like a full hype man. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. We got to tell the dogs it's done. Hey, sit down, sit down. Reef and Grom are on set. And, um, oh, there's, there's yeah. the legend. Too. We, hey, sit down, sit, sit, lay down okay that oh, was my dad here yeah okay stay stay all right sorry about that the dogs got excited my dad showed up a little behind the scenes had to settle everybody down but we're gonna jump into this thing really quick before this uh podcast is over and and for who is listening to this we really appreciate you guys don't forget drop a, a little a like and a no, just just follow us on uh, all the different multi platforms that we kind of got going on. I'm really new to this. This is like, this is like a new chapter in what we're doing, and I felt like we have a lot of really good stories to tell. And sitting here right now, we're gonna talk about a story, a moment to I think is the biggest wave ridden on the North Shore, hands down. We were out of reef. The waves were absolutely massive, and. Um, I told Kalani, hey, jump back up on the rope. Um, there's, I just, I don't know, like the day's almost done. Like, can you grab the rope? And you're like, kind of like, eh. you're kind of looking at me like, mm, I don't know. And I'm like, I just grab the rope. And you're like, okay. And uh, this set pops up on the horizon right when you grab the rope. And I'm like looking out there. And I'm like, Kalani, 
I don't know if this is a cloud or, or this is like the water changing colors or something like there, there's something coming, but I'm not sure if it's a wave and, um, and you're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. So, I mean, this is the first time I towed this wave and, and towed anybody into it actually. And this wave pops up and it's so big. It wasn't a cloud. It wasn't, it wasn't a dark spot in the water. It wasn't anything weird. It was like, it was a wave that I've never seen of that size before. And so, so when this thing popped on the horizon, I'm like trying to figure out which one you want. I'm like, Kalani, first one, second one, third one. I'm like driving the jet ski. Kalani's on the back. He's like, I want the third one. We go over the first one. It's big. The second one's even bigger. It's probably like 25 foot Hawaiian. We go over the third one to, to think about where we're surfing. It's probably about 60 feet of water and waves do not break uh, in this deep of water unless they're that big. And this next wave, I was, I was like, wow, that's the biggest wave I've ever seen on a jet ski. My best friend is in the back of me and I start towing you in this wave. And I was like, oh my God, what was your first thoughts of when I was towing you into this wave? For the most part, I just trusted you and your judgment of putting me in the right place. And, yeah. you know, I was just like ready for whatever that was coming my way. Yeah. I dropped in which felt like a never ending drop yep. realistically. And I was just, I was riding the wave. It was a good wave. I was riding the wave. It was, everything was going well until <laughs> I, uh, I came to this section that basically was closing out the channel and what felt like. Yeah. And, uh, I was, I had so much speed when I was straightening out. I had one second to glance up and see what, what I was actually dealing with. And I basically, it crossed my mind to like abandon ship and jump off my board. And literally like, I was like, I'm going to die literally. Yeah. And, uh, and then I just basically was like, no, I'm staying on my board and yeah. I'm, I'm going to see what happens. And the wave broke behind me just right on my tail basically and as soon as i fell in the water both my ears equalized and basically popped and the thing drove me so so far down and it was just bouncing me around like like a ping pong ball like in a huge area i, I was yeah. probably going from like you know from this corner of the room to that like 30 feet 30 foot areas yeah. just like in like a matter of like split seconds just this wave was so violent it was like a car accident yeah it was so vi so violent and i've never experienced anything like that luckily i had my flotation device and my inflatable and i pulled that thing and yeah it was bringing me to the surface and that's basically you know what i had on my i was just like if this thing this has to work. Otherwise I'm probably going to drown. Like, yeah. Yeah. Was... Well, so, so I remember like towing you into the wave and I'm like, looking back, I'm like, Oh my God, climbing super deep. But like, I felt like I put you in the perfect spot, which I was happy about being the driver watching you drop down this wave. I'm like, wow, this wave is so big, but I, I can't really tell what's going on. Cause I'm like following the wave. Cause I, I wasn't able to ride the wave with you the way towing surfing yeah. is most of the time. Like I got to kind of whip you in and, um, and as you're going down, I was like, wow, this wave's so big. I couldn't even believe it. And it was just like exploding out the back. Water's like shooting 100 feet in the air. Like this wave is like 35, 40 feet like face. And and like they they say the biggest wave ever ridden on the North Shore was how big? Ken Bradshaw back in the day. I don't know. I don't this know. was bigger. This was bigger. You, I could guarantee this wave is bigger. Bro, Kalani's the bombest wave. And after I saw the footage and the thing lands on his tail and explodes, I'm and and like I, I realized this. I'm like, oh my, oh my K. Okay, now I gotta go find him because I, I don't think he made this wave. And I'm like driving around looking around for Kalani. Kalani's underwater. I I, I can't see Kalani Chapman. He's in a red, like Quicksilver inflation vest. He's got impact. Like he's gonna pop up. And I'm like, look, you know, I gotta be careful because like if I come too close to him, I'm gonna hit him with a jet ski, and that's gonna be a whole nother thing. And then I it was probably like 20 seconds. Kalani comes firing up, boom, just pops up on the surface. I rip over there. I think I was like too late because like the next wave just ate him too. And then I had to like leave him, unfortunately. And then I came back and I grabbed him. And I'm like, he climbs on the sled on the back. It's like a rescue sled. And he's like, I'm like, are you all right, Kalani? What happened? He won't say anything. Dead quiet. I'm like, Kalani, Kalani. 
what happened? You okay? And you're just like, oh. <sighs> you're like kind of mad about what just happened, but you're like, <laughs> like just trying to like think about like what just happened to you. And you're like, you're in like the adrenaline just going through the roof, but you, you wouldn't talk to me for five minutes. And the first thing you go is, where's my board? Where's my board? We're going to find my board. And I'm just like, I'm like, what happened? You're like, why are my board? So we started going in and looking for Kalani's board. And we, we probably looked for like 20 minutes before he even actually told me anything. And then he's like, dude, that was so gnarly. The lip, I looked up and the lip was like about to land on my head. Like it was like a sunny day and everything went gray and dark. And, and it landed on my tail and shot me like way up in the air and then underwater like a like a car accident. It was the most violent thing I ever dealt with in my life. And I lost my my beautiful brewer, no, my out, uh, my um, brewer, brewer, balsa, balsa brewer tow board. We're just like we're all on a high. Like wow, I can't believe it. Our filmers are sending us clips of how big Kalani's wave was. I was like, wow, that wave is the biggest wave I've ever seen on the North Shore. I don't care what Ken Bradshaw says, because <laughs> I mean, it was it was just such a radical moment, and I was just like, I couldn't even believe that happened. And if the wave is so big, yeah. I didn't believe it. Dad, we're doing a podcast. You can't just chime in. <laughs> Uncle Mickle's allowed to. Yeah, he's my dad's over here. He's trying to chime in. What What are you trying to say? Bradshaw's wave wasn't that big. So. All right. There well, you have it. Yep. Kalani's wave was so big. How big you caught? That was the biggest wave of your life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> easily. I mean, I've caught huge waves other places. Yeah. Um, but that was the biggest, yeah. That was the biggest and baddest wave. Because that wave doesn't even start to break unless it's the biggest swells that the ocean has to offer. Like, yeah. this wave won't even break normally for years. Years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was breaking this day. I, I think I think, I think think what it makes sense why I named, named you Big Wave Dale. Because, like, <laughs> when the waves are big, you, like, freak out and, like, you start calling me and you have, like, a list of friends that are on your big wave list. And I'm one of your friends that, yeah. like, when the waves are big and gnarly, you're, like, I'm, like, one of the first people you call. So I'm very happy to be there on that day. And we've got some incredible rides. Um, we're going to end this uh, We're gonna end this uh, podcast in a little bit. But I wanted to ask you why did you change your name from Dale Chapman to Kalani Chapman? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't change it. Um you changed it. No, I didn't. What yeah. what it really was, you want to know what it really was? Is when I got the cover yeah. of Surfing Magazine uh -huh. when I was 18 years old. I didn't even know what they were going to call me when I, you know, I was, yeah. I was like, oh, what are they? <laughs> so I opened the mag and it was Kalani Chapman. Uh, and that kind of like solidified Kalani being my name. Because yeah. when I was younger, I had friends that called me Dale and friends that called me Kalani. And... It stayed that way till I was like 18 years old, literally. And then I got the cover and that's what they, that's what they called me in the mag. In the, yeah. And so therefore <laughs> that's what it was after that. But it was Dale Kalani Chapman. Yeah. And you just kind of took your middle name. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Cause like I'm James Duncan O'Brien. I've, I've never liked my middle name. I just, it just, it just Dunkin Donuts kind of funny, <laughs> like kind of weird, but yeah. like, I felt like you didn't like like Dale, like you were like Chip and Dale, like um, yeah, you know, it's um, yeah, it's kind of like a Duncan name. I'd feel like it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah. But every time, every time we kind of get into a serious moment, I call I call you Dale, and you go whatever Duncan. It's just yeah. kind of funny, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. My dad's got what? What are you? What are you trying to say, Dad? That was my mom's maiden name, oh. so it's my mom's fault. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so kind of, so what are you doing now and what's next for Kalani Chapman? Right now, basically I've been raising my little guy, Ayukai. Yep. He's five years old, you know, just a family man. Yep. And got my surf school going, yep. North Shore Beach Boys. Yep. North Shore Beach Boys. Check them out. Yep. I got my surf school going. Also shaping is a shaping big boards. part of my life. Yeah. And, uh, I also have been surfing still, you know, surfing yeah. and GoPro. I'm still riding for GoPro. So that's a blessing. And Sick. yeah, you know, just pipeline is pretty much the priority when the waves are good. Yeah. So, I mean, if you guys are looking to get a, a really rad surfboard, uh, client shaping surfboards, you could probably just drop them a, a message on Instagram and, yep. and be like, yo, shape me a board or, or, you know, like 
he or he does like advanced surf lessons like whatever it is he's kind of like a a jack of all trades here on the north shore but if you want a good pipe board good short board you know there's nothing better than a guy that shapes his own boards with his own two hands that are not machine shaped surfboards don't be a fool buying a surfboard buy a surfboard from a core surfboard shaper someone like kalani chapman will shape you a board like perfect to how you need to be riding the board don't don't take the shortcut by the board that someone at surf shop tries to tell you buy a board from a core surfer core shaper yep you put a lot of love in it and if you're looking for like an over the top surf experience on the north shore like <laughs> like over the top like push your surfing to a whole new level you can check out client surf school north shore beach boys yeah yep, yep. yeah check us out yeah, yeah. so he's kind of he's kind of got all uh bases covered here on the north shore Growing up, having a family, beautiful wife, and living the dream. Yeah, just, you know, trying to stay a surfer as much as possible. As long as we're know, doing pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah, no complaints. I'm not 40 yet, but I'm right around the corner, buddy. How's it feel? Ah, it's great, you know, <laughs> just getting a little slower. Nah, a little nah. slower. No, 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 <laughs> no. I'll never admit that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, perfect. Thank you guys for watching the podcast. I appreciate you guys. Uh, check check us out on different streaming platforms. We are on Apple. We're on Spotify. We are just getting this thing figured out. I'm just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like this is like, I don't know. I feel like this is like the new age of vlogging in a certain which way or form. And I thought it'd be cool that we could sit down with friends and tell epic stories of our life. And I feel like if we didn't do the pod, then no one would ever know. Some of these rad stories we talked about today. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. And uh, I hope to be back soon. Yeah. You know? Got a lot more to say. This is just a start. This is just the start of a long friendship. We've been friends probably 35 years now, maybe uh, 36 years. And yeah, we'll keep this thing going. And I'll see you at a pipeline or see you in the surf somewhere. Yep. Yeah, you will. Right on, you guys. We're peacing out. Um, we're going to do a quick ender here for the YouTube channel. Don't forget, click link right here to subscribe, right here to watch more podcasts. Hit that. Oh, there's no site counter. But uh, just check out Jamie O'Brien. No, it's not even Jamie O'Brien. Check out staypsych.com. Peace.